Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Brooks, and I will introduce today's presenter for the Weeding webinar. Mark Wildman is the Assistant Director for Patron Services at DeWitt Community Library. He has over 25 years of library experience in serials, cataloging, and collection management. Mark is familiar with weeding from both sides of librarianship as a subject bibliographer and as a supervisor of a technical services department where deselected books are processed and withdrawn from the online catalog. He also has experience in academic, public, and special libraries and the issues that concern weeding at these similar yet different institutions. So welcome, Mark, and we will turn things over to you. Thanks, Jessica. And uh, thank you for the lovely welcome. And everybody, uh, welcome. And just to let you know, this is my first online webinar as a presenter. So I usually do this face to face. So um, bear with me as I, I go through this. But I think we're going to have a great time. One of the things I like to tell people up front is that you, um, you know sometimes we're trained during our library experience, or most of us are bibliographers or selectors uh, for certain subjects or maybe for the entire library. And that seems much easier task than when it comes to weeding because we, we have such trepidation about taking things out of our collection that we've lovingly purchased uh, with the best intentions that it's just going to be flying off the shelves all the time. And sometimes that's wonderful. We want those things to fly off the shelves all the time, but with that also comes wear and tear. Um, and the longer we have it in our collection, sometimes it outdates itself. So we're going to just explore some of those types of issues today. Um, I encourage people to either post questions. Uh, at the end, you will have my um, personal information. I feel free to email me or call me uh, to discuss something in person that you uh, may not either have time for us to address today in the time period we have. Uh, this normally is a, a th about two and a half hour to three hour face-to-face -face presentation because we do lots of discussion and, and I encourage that. So we're going to see what we can do and hopefully I can leave ourselves some time at the end of this presentation. So let's get into and delve into and thank you Nora is I credit Nora. Nora is the person who came up with this wonderful wonderful title Collection Development's Evil Twin. So let's, oops, let me, there we go. All right, so I don't know any of you, but I've seen this in my lifetime. Collection development is not hoarding with that popularity of those hoarding shows that are out there uh, today. Um, I've walked into either bookstores or libraries that have some area like this because they've either gone from the stacks into some hideous storage room or something. Um, I took these off the internet, so I don't know. I can't attribute them to anybody. If they're yours, shame on you. <laughs> so let's talk about weeding and address weeding. Oops, where am I going? So what's great about weeding? Well, the first thing is, is that when people walk into your library, your collection should reflect your attitude about the service you provide. Um, so. People expect to come in, they want something modern, hip, cool, delightful. Um, I, I don't think I've ever gone into any libraries as we all go around the country, and I always try to hit every single little library that I pass. That um, I've walked into anything that's like shockingly hideous or anything like that. But some of us have our little areas and secrets and, and, and places where there's some items that really shouldn't still be in our collection. Um, to engage people today, especially our younger generations, they want things that look fresh and cool and new. Um, you want your collections to be reliable, reliable in retrieval and reliable in, uh, in, in currency and information. Uh, the collections to be attractive. The collection you want to be up to date. Again, efficient. It's, it's, it can be efficiently retrieved. Uh, it flows efficiently. So I would like to give an example of when I was at Cortland uh, um, State College that we had a, a teaching materials center and part of that were picture books 
for early children's literacy. When I arrived there, there were hordes of books that were just old, uh, decrepit, falling apart, been taped up a million times and everything like that, and mainly because they were classics and, you know, they had those old, beautiful illustrations that were really cool from the 50s and the 60s. And we decided that this, uh, it wasn't getting attention, people were complaining about it, the students needed to use these materials. So we went through and we withdrew things based on, just based on physical condition, mostly. And we replaced what we could with modern editions um, or, you know, duplicate editions that we could uh, replace. Uh, we found that our circulation increased about 30%. Uh, so it was just showing that our, our kids were going to the, to the library in the city instead of coming right to our beautiful materials center. So all of that counts. So why don't we do it? Uh, for a lot of us, unfortunately, it's time. It is time consuming. Many of us, it's fear. A lot of people I talk about it, they're just so, have such trepidation about going in and, and taking something and, and throwing it out, whether it's resold or something like that, but they just, um, and insecurity about how to do it. Uh, people, just, again, it's, we learn a lot about collection development. We don't talk a lot about weeding in college. If you were, even, even were able or, or had the privilege of taking um, a collection development course. Um, a lack of planning. It's not in the big picture. Uh, weeding should be a continual process, just like you're putting items into the um, collection over the year as you're purchasing things. Uh, you know, what goes in has to come out, and unfortunately we'll talk about sometimes um, it's space considerations. That's a, a big uh, problem here at DeWitt. For those of you that don't know, we're looking for building a bigger library very soon, hopefully. And the ever popular librarians or bibliolics, books are our friends, we love books, we don't, we feel like throwing them out or discarding them and not saving them by taping them a million times. Uh, we just don't want to let them go. So have heart, be ruthless, get out there. I always say my job here is to be a big cheerleader for, for weeding and, and get rid of it. All right, I always just, I just love this, a librarian in, Port Townsend, Washington, lost her job because she refused to weed her library collection after being ordered to do so by her library board. She sued to regain her job but kept losing in court. The case finally went to the United States Supreme Court, which refused to consider the case. So this woman was definitely one of those biblioholics and hoarder probably and uh, just had that I, I can't do this, I can't do this, and it's a must. It's part of our profession, it's part of what we need to do. So let's start delving into this a little deeper. One of the first things that you really should make sure you have is to make sure your collection development policy includes a weeding policy. Uh, this is not only for your staff, but a lot of times protection for you for when the public says, why are you throwing out this book? Or why is this book that you purchased for the library collection on the sale cart? Um, so you're disposing of per, perhaps, depending on your library, taxpayers' money, state, state money, tuition funds, or whatever. So have that protection. Make sure that you have some kind of statement about your library collection. I have this here. I'm uh, hopefully on your screens. Um, it looks pretty big. This just happens to be uh, the weeding policy section from uh, Cortland uh, State College where I used to work, uh, but there's many examples out on the web also. But make sure you have that protection. Um, so let's talk about some weeding philosophies. You know, so you have this generic statement, but here's some things that um, if you look in, you know, the professional literature and stuff like that, that these are the the types of philosophies that are out there. So here's kind of the hoarder. The collection should be kept absolutely intact. Um, just remember a lot of these have to do with your mission, um, and we'll discuss that in a little bit also. 
Um, the collection may be weeded gingerly by professionals only, and by professionals I usually mean a librarian, uh, using good judgment and not rules. So um, I kind of lean towards this one, uh, but a, a combination of these also. Collections should be weeded so that they are maintained at a per predetermined physical size. We're kind of in that situation here at DeWitt uh, because we're running out of space and we're growing and we need more space. So, um, but sometimes people say like, okay, the humor section is this big. A children's library, certainly we have this amount of space for our children's. Mark, all of a sudden you stopped speaking. Was that intentional? Sounds like you might be muted. Mark? Oh, there I am. Am I there? There now. Hello? Now you're now you're back. For a minute or two you okay, were. Okay, something happened. Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. And I can, and we can, can you hear, hear me? you too. Where did I leave off? Ah, uh, <laughs> let's see. You were just talking about the predetermined yes, predetermined physical sizes and the fact that uh, children's sections may have to be just that size, or the humor section may have to be just that okay. size. Okay, great, good. So you didn't miss anything, really. Um, uh, those books least likely to be used uh, in the future be removed. I think that kind of makes sense. You don't want things in your collection that you pretty basically know that uh, either have not been used in several years um, or no longer being used. The library stacks should be stocked with those volumes likely to give the library the greatest circulation. That's also kind of obvious. Those are when we're making selections for our collections, that's what we have in our mind. We certainly want whatever, and we feel in our hearts, <laughs> that of course this book that I think the collection should have must be in here and it's going to circulate wildly once it's in there. And unfortunately, I think all of us has, has at some time uh, removed a book or achieved a book and found out that it's never circulated um, or it's circulated one or two times. And that happens. That's part of our profession. That's part of our judgment as far as um, purchasing. And um, that's okay. You're all right. Weeding should increase circulation. Well, that's uh, certain. Um, it, when things start piling up on the shelves, when the shelves start getting packed, when the shelves start getting difficult to maneuver um, and to retrieve things, and things on the shelves look uh, ratty, um, people are not necessarily going to be drawn to them. You want to draw attention to your collection. You want people drawn to it and want to peruse it. Many people come into our libraries with a specific item in mind, but we also have people that like to come in and browse the collection. And if it looks ratty and in disorder, uh, that's going to be discouraging to the patron, and they're going to leave. And they're going to find another library that, with a collection that looks clean and smooth and, and crisp. The collection should be weeded so that the speed of access, and I'm sorry, I'm probably not on the right. Um, slide, forgive me for that. Um, the collection should be weeded so that the speed of access increased and so that the accuracy and retrieval is improved. So again, that's uh, making that retrieval uh, easy for your users um, so that things can be retrieved quickly. And that's not only for your users, but for your staff as well. There are several scientific and mathematical approaches. I'm not a huge fan of this process. They can become, I've seen hugely complex ones, you know, whether it's an English book and it's been used at least 48 times and costs less divided by, you know, the cost of the book times the amount of people in the community, blah, 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 you know, uh, they get very complicated. I do and have become more and more of an advocate of using um, online reports, reports that you can retrieve from your online systems. Uh, there are ways that you can manipulate that, looking at things that haven't, um, haven't 
circulated in the last X amount of years or months, whatever criteria that you have. Um, things that have circulated over a certain amount of times, those are things you might want to look at for wear and tear. Um, I particularly look at um, audio type of materials, CD, DVD type materials that have circulated um, over a hundred times or something like that if they are lucky enough to make it that long. Okay, Nora, you'll alert me if there's any pertinent burning questions. I, I haven't seen any. Pretty well. I haven't seen any yet, Mark, but I do have a, a comment. I didn't sure. notice, maybe I didn't hear because there were a couple of background issues, but I didn't hear you mention the out-of-date science, medical, or uh, because those can be critically important if somebody reads something antique that is no correct. longer correct, accurate scientifically, but also political, uh, not, it's not political correctness, but currency and understanding of things from our current society. I know I read Tarzan and I was going to read that to my children and discovered <laughs> that my father's vintage 1924 edition or when it, whatever it was from, something in that time period, was so sexist and racist. I was making up more than I was saying from the yes. book. And yes. you want to be attentive to that. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, and, that, and that's uh, coming up a little bit, but yes, that's absolutely uh, political correctness, uh, things that are outdated that you wouldn't think were outdated, uh, definitely comes into consideration. So we'll, uh, thank you for bringing that up, and we'll, and we'll talk about that a little more uh, in a bit. So before you in dive into this wonderful activity, it's so much fun, we want to make sure Make sure um, staff-wise, either you know, with your leadership at the library, uh, with your staff, um, if you're doing collection development collaboratively, which most of us, I think, are, uh, you want to have some open discussions and meetings. Some people are more uh, open and uh, comfortable with reading where there are some that are not, and some may have some very um, opinionated um, issues with certain collections or with reading in general. You hopefully want to agree on a method, but if you're all doing reading individually, as, as we do here, um, then the exact method is not particularly important, um, whether somebody uses reports or those different types of philosophies, but just to have a general agreement of how reading is going to be done, how aggressive it needs to be at this point uh, in the library's um, you know, year or whatever. Um, and then who will actually make the decisions to withdraw things? Sometimes we'll have, you know, we can run reports and have pages um, or volunteers pull books and then the librarian can review and peruse them and, and at that point be able to choose which items need to be withdrawn and which items still need to be retained. Uh, who will actually do the physical processing? Um, depending on the size of your library and the type of library, um, as a former technical services uh, division head, you know, just don't come in with, you know, a huge cart of books and expect, hey, these need to just be withdrawn um, and keep compiling the problem. Um, technical services does need to make time for that. Uh, some of us at smaller libraries, I know here, generally we withdraw our own items. It's very easy. We just have to scan the barcodes into the system, create a file, and hit a button to go bye-bye. Um, and then how the books will be discarded. We're going to talk about this a little bit towards the end, but have an agreement on how the books can be discarded but also know your legal options um, or um, rights that you have to follow. Um, if you're a state institution, that has different implications. If you're a county library, what is their um, rules and regulations about the disposition of or disposal of property? Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, more later when we talk about that. So one of the first considerations and the big things most people, um, why reading needs to occur is space. At some point as we keep adding 
things. Oops, I'm sorry, I keep on forgetting. I'm using some paper slides here. So, um, is space. So does your collection, and, and this is one thing that I wanted to talk to too. So as far as space, does your collection match your current mission? Is your mission to be an archive? then you want to be probably keeping everything you can possibly get your hands on. Is it a specific archive? Is it a music archive? Does, um, is it um, a film archive? You know, should you still be keeping 16 millimeter films or something? So uh, what is your mission? What is vital for you to keep in your collection? Everybody hopefully at their library should have some kind of special um, collection that's unique to them um, that you're noted for. But um, make sure your collection policy matches your mission. Are you an academic institution? Are you a public library where most of the people you're providing general information um, but mainly recreational reading for people? Um, do you have room for storage? Is there uh, some place where you can put some books where you can, uh, um, I'm a little undecided or, you know, this is has you know local history or something like that where you can have some storage facilities. Um, mostly our bigger and academic institutions are able to handle that better than our private institute or public libraries. Uh, do you have the funds to expand? Are you at the point where it's like, okay, we do need to keep this, we can't keep on reading. Um, perhaps we need to be looking at an expansion to our library. Mark, we have a question. Yes. Chuck sure. O'Brien from SUNY Oneonta says, what's wrong with having rules? What's wrong with having rules? For discarding or, or weeding. What's wrong with that? Right. I'm not really understanding why, what's wrong with having, I mean, you if should have rules for discarding. I'm sorry, I, I mean, because of this, we're coming up to that. All right. Uh, when we get to that point, how about if we let Chuck uh, voice his question or comment? Sure, sure, sure. Maybe I may, I may we'll have said that. something that was misunderstood or maybe I misspoke. Oh, um, previous, he, says the, he says that the previous slide said judgment, not rules. Oh, that's just a philosophy. So there are, I mean, there there is room for, one of the philosophies is, yes, like like having rules or um, criteria. And we'll be talking about that in a, a few minutes. Are we okay with that? Or when we get to that, we can, he can... Uh, um, Chuck, is again. that, Chuck, do you want to, I've unmuted you. Do you want to say a word now or wait until we see that other slide and, and Mark goes into it in a little more depth? No, we're good. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, no, we do want Thanks. rules. I, that is here somewhere. <laughs> yes, that'll be coming up. Sorry. I, I was just, I'm just, I just was repeating a, a certain philosophy. Um, I certainly don't believe in that, and we'll, we'll be touching on that. Um, okay, so we talked about expanding. And then all of us, I believe, should have some kind of um, access to ILL. I don't think there's anybody out there really that doesn't have that. Some are, may have a little more difficulty uh, with accessing that. But, um, you know, sometimes when I look at a book and I'm hemming and hawing about it, I'm like, okay, look in WorldCat. Who's got it? Somebody near me have it. Is it someplace else in my, you know, library system? You know, there's 38 copies in the system. Do I necessarily need to be holding on to this one? Because I know I can get it via ILL. And most of the time, delivery of ILL is pretty expedient. Okay, so things to consider. And here's some ideas for when you go into your stacks. Here's some things that you really need to consider. Uh, weeding based on appearance and condition. This is actually a little biggie. That book looks worn as all heck, but I mean, it's, it looks, it, it just looks bad on ourselves. It looks like we don't have concern or care. Um, certainly if it's something that is historic and you absolutely have to have, you can't 
replaced. Um, a, you may need to consider putting that someplace where it's safer um, if people uh, need it, uh, boxing it, having it rebound. Um, but you know, we can only tape something so much until it starts to look really hideous in our collection. Duplicates should be the easiest. I mean, you can even just do this by, you know, walking down your stacks and looking and being like, oh, side by side, here's two books that are exactly the same. Um, academic libraries don't have this issue as much as us public libraries, where we're buying, you know, five or six or more versions of the latest Patterson book or something and no longer need seven of those copies. Maybe we need only one or two. Um, so that's easy. And a lot of um, ILS systems, management systems, are, uh, can run a duplicate report very easily. Uh, newer, older editions or reprints, uh, when something is um, a new version, a new edition comes out, something like that, you know, do you need the last 10 years of some kind of index or um, referency type of material. So pulling the older editions um, or, uh, is very easy to do. Superfluous materials, I always have to be careful saying that word, I think it do. Uh, things that are outdated themselves, uh, travel guides, textbooks, um, medical type of information particularly. Um, law material, things that you, you definitely, and that kind of goes into the poor or dated content too. Um, you definitely want to be extremely careful about having outdated medical information or law information or something that may endanger the people that are using that material. And I always recommend that um, when you're withdrawing those materials is to discard them, throw them, throw them away. Uh, do not try to sell them or give them to the public because, again, you're, you're possibly giving some information to somebody that could be harmful to them. You don't really want to put that in, in the hands of anyone. Language. Um, academic institutions used to be required to have a certain amount of Russian material and you know, foreign language material. Um, fortunately, that's, uh, you know, for accreditation, that's no longer true. Um, do you have language collection? I mean, your population in your, you know, for a public library or something like that, you may focus on a certain language. Um, you may have a Polish community in the area or something like that, but you no longer have that. Or your uh, Polish generation has, you know, it's a new generation of, you know, Polish immigrants perhaps or something where um, they no longer um, have Polish as their primary language and, and are not circulating those materials. So those are some of the things to consider. And here's where you start basing your rules. Um, so you know, when you sit down to say, how are we going to weed? Well, let's, OK, rules. We're going to pull out any duplicates. We're going to pull out anything that's you know, older than 10 years old or something. Um, anything with poor content, anything that's you know, in you know, Czechoslovakian or something like that. Some more things to consider, the age of material. Um, I love the old um, slips that were in books where you could see them stamped. Um, or they've been uh, a wonderful thing, if you're not doing it now already, is to put a date stamp when you processed and put a book into your collection. Put it right in that opening spine, or right, you know, right in that opening fold inside the book, because here I can either look at those um, old date stamp sheets to see how often it was circulating and when it was last circulating, um, or I can look very quickly um, at when it was put into the collection so I can make a quick decision, depending on the type of material, to withdraw that based on the age of the eye. Something put you into mute again. We're missing you, Mark. Mark? Actually, or CDs. Actually Mark, there was me. a pause there. I'm sorry. If you go back just a couple of sentences. Sure. Okay. We were talking about age? I believe so, yes. Okay. 
Yep, just looking at age, I was talking about um, having a date stamp in the, uh, the crease of the books so that you can quickly, I don't know why I keep fading in and out, I apologize for that, but um, looking, being able to quickly access that information without having to run a report or something like that. That age, you can just open up that book really quick and see, oh, this is 10 years old, this should be withdrawn. Um, the special classes and materials, I have LPs down here as an example, but actually LPs are making a comeback um, because the sound quality is not as crisp um, and clear and, uh, uh, and for CDs. But there may be uh, a rule to say, okay, we're specifically getting rid of perhaps cassette tapes. Um, we don't have any cassette tapes in our collection any longer. Um, so that's an easy weed. It's like, to, let's get rid of all the cassette tapes and make a decision to do that. Um, specific classes of materials and specific ages. Textbooks, a lot of textbooks quickly outdate themselves. And, um, or you just may no longer want to carry textbooks in your uh, collection or indexes or materials on, you know, certain subjects. Usage patterns. Um, I look usually at everything I, I pull out of my collection um, because I, it's, it's workable and manageable as far as time to look at how many times it's circulated, when's the last time it's circulated. And based on that, using my own judgment can say, okay, um, this has probably seen as much circulation as it's going to get. A replacement. This is a biggie if it's uh, heavily used, uh, you know, whether it's one of your classics books, um, especially, you know, children's books that are heavily used and are in, get, starting to get in ratty condition, replace it. Replace it with a new book that's nice, new, and crisp. Or also talking about replacements as far as if something's outdated and you need something updated. Um, see if there's a replacement um, of something that has a later date or it's more up to date. Uh, then considering when to do your weeding. Uh, whether the entire staff's going to come together and say, okay, by the end of the month we're going to weed the collection down to X, uh, or if it's something um, you're going to close the library or do it for some reason, but just have an idea of when to do it. And for a large size collection, this should be something that you're doing on a regular basis. Okay, I've talked about tape. So when it becomes more tape than book, throw it out or replace it, uh, or have it rebound, uh, or put it in a, uh, in, in a box, boxed it up, put it someplace uh, where if it's fragile, it's going to uh, not get in worse condition. So here's kind of rules, keeping criteria. You, you need to have some rules that's going to help you along. Um, you know, you need to have some ideas, and I didn't mean to insinuate that. And, and like I said, that was just a philosophy that was in one of the professional uh, journals as far as keeping materials. And I think we'll make it time-wise. So have a set of keeping criteria. What do you want to? What do you want to keep? There's certain things that you know need to be kept. Local history. Um, you know, certain types and any type of certain materials that you feel that are important to your collection um, as a staff that you want to keep. Certain subjects or formats lend themselves to keeping. History. History is not an easy collection to, um, to weed because history is history. Although, depending on the subject of that history, as more academic studies are going on, we're finding out some new things. So just make sure it does accurately reflect what part of history we are talking about. Um, 
and for certain formats, you know, microfilm, although a lot of people are getting rid of their microfilm because now things are online, but is there certain microfilm that you want to retain? Certainly I would recommend that you retain your local newspaper if you have it on microfilm or microfiche. Um, but then also the consideration needs to be, do you have the equipment for the person to, to view that material? This I kind of say, but I don't be offended, but be, we, we are all being good custodians of our money. And when we're purchasing, we're careful about what we're spending. I certainly look at some books and it's like, wow, that's way too much for me to spend on that book to put in my collection to, you know, take the chance that it's going to get enough circulation for me to justify that. But also taking that item out of your collection, it's not your money. And, and that's, you know, it, it, it's hard to get used to. I don't want to offend anybody by saying that. And for those of you that are small libraries, I know that's easier said than, you know, um, easier said than done because you have smaller budgets. But when you start looking in the, the grand scheme of things, when you have, you know, an 80, 000, if you're fortunate enough to have an $80,000 collection development budget or more, um, you know, that's $1,750, it's okay. It's, it's taking up space, room. It's not going anywhere. So um, if, if it makes you feel anybody, just remember, okay, this was not my personal money that I, I put in there. And then don't be sentimental about it. It's like, oh, I remember this book when I was a little kid, and I just can't stand getting rid of this. Um, get a new copy. Get a new edition or something. Um, or if it's just something that's not, you know, was your favorite book, but just because it was your favorite book doesn't mean it was everybody else's. So try not to be sentimental. And that, that's hard to. I'm going to quickly touch base because this was a big part of my background. Um, I'm, I'm reading periodicals and serials, so look for things to get rid of that are available in, in other formats. A lot of this material is now available online. Um, periodicals that are not indexed, and this is mainly more for academic libraries than it is for the, uh, the public libraries. Things that have ceased publication. Um, you know, you may want to hold on to it for a while, but you know, if it ceased publication five years ago, you know, why not get rid of um, it? And a lot of these are things that, you know, uh, when we get to the full year, we bind together. Um, incomplete sets, if you have volume 16 through 24 and you're missing all the rest, you may want to get rid of that. Um, early runs that are no longer used, you may want to keep the more current items than you do the uh, older items. Maybe keeping the latest only, maybe the latest year only. Um, and then for those of you who know of JSTOR and Muse and the rules and regulations about that, that's where we're talking about either keeping the earlier runs or the latest five years, whatever that moratorium that JSTOR and Muse have for keeping those materials. So what about you? I've talked about different types of institutions. This is usually if we're meeting in, in person where I have people break up into these groups to discuss um, what pertains to them. So, But this is where your mission comes into play, whether you're a public library, whether you're an academic library, whether you're a special collection. Um, you're going to have different rules and criteria for keeping or for weeding materials. So those are some things some of you that are meeting as groups um, may want to uh, stay together afterwards or plan some other time to, um, to have that discussion. Mark, this might be a very good time for me to unmute everybody and see if there are any comments that people have not typed in but would like to make or questions they'd like to ask you. Would that be okay? Sure, that's totally up to you. Okay. Yeah, we're, um, we're almost there. So. If you have a question, please go ahead and take the mic. If it turns out to be too much chaos, we'll figure out a system. <laughs> Anybody have a question or a comment from your own experience or your own institution? Is this a, whoops, what did I just say? From Liverpool. It looks like there's a question in the chat box. All right. Liverpool Public Library asked, what do you do about patrons who are mad you're weeding? 
Oh. All right, I don't know what that was, but um, that's that's where having that weeding policy or that and that philosophy um, in your uh, collection development policy, so that you can pull that out to protect yourself and say, uh, you know, this is a this is a normal part of maintaining a library collection. So you can. That's why. If it's more continuous, it's better because it's kind of unseen or seen as a routine process. There have been a lot of libraries that have gotten into huge troubles when they start filling their dumpsters with books and throwing them out. Because somebody sees that and they're like, holy God, what are you, you know, throwing out all of these books for? So having that philosophy and that, that, um, that collection development policy and having reading be part of that can help you with that issue. But you're always going to have somebody that, you know, thinks you should be keeping everything. Absolutely. So thank you, Linda. Okay, Linda Park says, how about faculty who didn't want to let things go? Okay, I'm going to have to mute everybody, but I will read questions, so please type them in. And then I will unmute. Mark, for obvious reasons, oh. and Jessica. But uh, Linda Park at Cuca College says, how about faculty who don't want to let things go? Um, <laughs> I'm very familiar with that, with that issue. Um, that, uh, that, that's part of having that, that, that collection development policy, too, that includes weeding, um, that you can you know, let the faculty know that this is a normal part of maintaining a library collection and uh, you can tell them to go advocate for more space and, and a new wing to the to, to your library <laughs> um, but again that's that's you know having and hate to say it sometimes I mean you know if you have that little book card out there in the lobby to with you know things that are withdrawn on it to sell or give away um, that can be upsetting to some of the faculty. Um, that's not a problem that's ever probably going to go away. That's the mentality of the faculty member that it's like, these are my books, this is my subject area, you can't possibly get rid of this. Um, and they're also always tempted to uh, start their own library over in their own department and that can bring in some dangers and some issues also. So, but good question. Quick comment. This is Nora. Uh, you might offer it to them if it's truly discarded from your collection, but they personally feel they would like to have it in their own office, which may look like a hoarder stack. But anyway, uh, and we also have a couple more typed in questions. Uh, Laura Mandel says, we have some mobile large print collections for lo local facilities. Some of these are favorites, which are no longer in print. There is outrage when we weed these items out, typically due to wear. How else do you suggest we describe what we are doing? Let's see. For local facilities. I don't, I'm not sure what you mean by local facilities there, Laura. Um, Wait a minute, I can unmute her. Perhaps she can speak and tell us. Laura, you're not muted anymore. I guess you're, lo you're muted locally. Could you, can you, well, looks like you're at Guernsey probably. Could you unmute yourself and tell us what you had in mind? Okay, you're unmuted. Can't hear you yet though. Okay, I think, I mean, again, I think I'm just going to go back to my, your reading policy. I mean, if they're worn out, they're worn out. There's nothing that you can uh, do about that. Again, this is, you know, handling, uh, explaining that reading is a, you know, if it's room, if it's a room issue, um, to say we don't have room to, we, we can't buy new things if we don't withdraw old things. And if these are people that want current um, and coming back and our avid readers, they want new things, so the old things must go. Laura said, I think, excuse oh, me. I just wanted to add one more point is um, if 
you can always play up the interlibrary loan services that you have available. If some of those materials are available at other libraries, you can always tell your patrons that they can get them through that service. That's true. Uh, Laura clarifies that this would be old age homes, nursing homes, things like that, those facilities she mentioned. We do have another question, though. This one's from Emily Wormuth. She says, as part of a fundraising effort, we have some children's books that are specially marked in memory of. Any suggestions on what to do with these books? these books which are not circulating without offending anybody? Um, unfortunately, sometimes you do have people that come in and look for these, but generally your, as part of your collection development policy also, you should have that any book that if somebody gives you a book, uh, we are under um, no obligations to keep that item. Um, so that comes with um, that protects you also when people give you books for, in, you know, thinking that you're going to add them to your collection where you might um, sell them um, or they might be in poor condition. I, you know, the sniff test, if anybody doesn't know about that, when that smells musty, that goes right into the garbage. Don't get any mold or mildew into your collection at all. But you'll be doing huge amount of weeding. So um, your collection development should say, then stipulate that any item added to the collection uh, um, under any circumstances um, d does not mean that the item will be retained. Because after a certain time, yeah, that book, you know, might have been somebody's favorite children's book. You know, it's sooner or later it's going to wear out or it's going to be untimely. Thanks. I don't see any further questions, so I guess we're ready to move on. Thank you. Okay, just a couple. Um, setting out, just, you know, these are just general, you know, wear comfortable clothes. If you're going to be in a really musty, dusty area, you know, you don't want. Um, one of the things I remember from my days at Syracuse University, some of those older books that are um, in leather, um, that, that stuff comes off on your hands and your clothing and you can't get it out. So don't wear anything that you're going to ruin. I ruined a few very nice things. We bought ourselves some nice doctor lab jackets to look cool in. But you know, you need step stool. One, this reminds me of one thing is that when you get, do get out into your stacks, try to avoid as much as possible the temptations to, oh, this needs to be rebound, or this needs to be remarked, oh, this needs to be um, recataloged or something like that. Try to focus on the, on the project um, if you possibly can. If you're a smaller library and it's only a few things, that's fine, but um, as a former cataloger, <laughs> <laughs> I know getting into the stacks, you can start seeing things, and then you're into an entirely other new project. Um, disposal. I find that most people are pretty up to date and know a lot about this. Um, just the one main thing is, do you have stipulations from your institution, your county, your town, uh, whichever, that stipulate the disposal materials? Some people are not allowed to sell the materials. Uh, some people they have to be discarded. Some people they have to be bid on. Some, I mean, it, there's some crazy rules out there. So just make sure that you know that so that you're not doing anything um, illegal or anything like that. Um, and you're, you're, you're doing it on the up and up. Mark, um, I have to share a little, little uh, comic moment from, uh, I was at a meeting yesterday with many school librarians, and one librarian said that they had a book from their collection which was no longer going to be kept, so she marked a discard and put it out in the trash. It came back four times. The custodian <laughs> kept retrieving it and presenting it back to her. <laughs> Someone else said that, well, so-and-so had had an, a set of encyclopedias. She actually took them out, took them home one at a time, and buried them because people were <laughs> in such uproar about this outdated, incorrect set of encyclopedia. And that was the only way she could figure out to do it without, um, without the heavens opening and all sorts of nastiness incurring. 
We do have another question, though. Sure. Is there a general rule of thumb for weeding fiction in a public library? Is it okay to weed part of the author's collection if it's no longer circulating? Has the advent of e-books and online resources changed weeding criteria? That's from Jane. Excellent question, and I meant to, to talk about this. Do you need, I mean, I, I meant to look up this morning how many books James Patterson has published. Do you need that entire collection? Um, you know, I, this is where I, I, I call Mark's theory of natural deselection. Um, when that book starts to get worn out, uh, weary, or something like that, dirty. I, kind of, with fiction, I kind of sometimes look at it and be like, would I want to get into bed with this item <laughs> and uh, you know, sleep with it? If it's dirty, gross, falling apart, or whatever, you're, do you need to replace it? Um, or or try to fix it, um, or do you actually do you need all seventy something volumes of that collection in perpetuity? And that's where ILL comes into play, um, I believe. And Jessica, thank you for mentioning that earlier. Um, Nora's remark about like stamping something discard. I always have people. We always have people call. Oh, I found this book and I think it belongs to you. Blah blah blah. And you know, I've heard people call from like Florida or something like that. I always say, open up the front cover and does it say discard and has it been stamped discard? And they'll be like, yes. And I'm like, well, thank you very much for thinking of us, but no, that book was actually removed from our collection. So that a little extra stuff sometimes can help in those situations. Um, Having a book sale, annual, ongoing, some people have annual uh, book sales or semi-annual um, or ongoing book sales. Do you want to just hand everything over to an antiquarian or a book dealer or something like that? Sometimes they'll just give you one sweeping, you know, I'll pay you 300 bucks for what you're getting. Um, a freebies cart out front, just take them, and that may be because you can't sell them, you can't give them away, but maybe you can give them away. Um, the dumpster. But I told you the dumpster horror story. You don't want to fill up dumpsters and have somebody get a hold of that. Um, or giving it to another institution. And then most of us all know, I think, about uh, you know, sell and recycle as much as possible. Discard any discard. Get rid of it. Don't give it to somebody else. Any harmful um, or outdated information. Most people I find now know about Better World books. Uh, logistics and and Zubel books. Um, everybody I've really talked to has had really good experiences with Better World books. If you're not familiar with them, uh, give them a look up, and uh, they will actually send you boxes. They send you the tape. They send you the shipping labels, and they actually and then they send you UPS call tags, and they'll take books off of your um, out of your hands. Um, and that might be well for either some huge if you're doing a huge withdrawal project um, or you cannot sell the items either. And you actually can make a little money from Better World Books, um, but um, they, um, they sell the books. Their money goes to promote literacy and some of the books are given to poor countries and areas where they can be utilized and, and receive a second life and I think that's great. And I see it's about Two of or so, um, Nora? So yes, we've got a couple of minutes. Anybody got, okay, uh, let's see. Jane says, many schools and towns have green fiber dumpsters now. They make money off the books one throws into the dumpster. I that's true, and that. if they can be recycled, um, that's great. So it depends on your recycler. Um, some don't take hardbound books, but um, you can check on, certainly check on that. And again, anything green, you know, anything that's throwing them out, I think is fantastic. Finding um, a life for a book, we all want to see that happen. Because we love our books. And rah, 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 go out and, and weed. And oh. if anybody does have a question, please feel free to call me. I've got my slide up there. Um, or you can email me, and I would be happy to take some time to 
answer your questions personally. Or if you've got a minute, you can type it in now, and I'm sure Mike, Mark will spend just a minute or two more on, online to address any questions you've got Absolutely. now. Whenever you need to log me off, I'm, I'm yours. Okay. While we're thinking about that, please be sure to fill out the post-session evaluation survey. I have the URL, and I'm currently pasting it into your chat area. It will also be included in your um, email that you receive when we post the recording because the recording for this session will be available online on the SCRLC website. And we really appreciate your coming today and being part of the web webinar. We hope you will join us again. Please keep your eye on the SCRLC webinar uh, website for future webinars and in-person training opportunities. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Happy Friday. Bye-bye.